We're going to continue our study on stewards. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, and then verse 7. Moreover, it is required in students, students, well, that's true, students need to be, youth, you're dismissed, by the way, I apologize, you may go. Until further notice, youth, you are always dismissed and can go to your class after the offering. If that isn't applicable, we will let you know. So in future, because I apologize, even though I had it at the top of my page, I'm not sitting there with youth, so I'm not thinking, when are they going to go? Actually, it's probably not the parents so much that wants them to go. It's the youth that let me out of here. <laughs> Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And there's in Proverbs, who can find a faithful man? Faithfulness is not something we have in abundance today. You can see that out in the streets and, and things that are happening. Verse 7. We're faithful with, as a steward because a steward is over a house. But what this is so amazing. For who makes thee to differ from another? And what have you that you did not receive? Now if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? Everything we have, we've received. We've received because of Jesus, because of the goodness of God. So we don't have to glory in ourselves. So being a steward over the house, over a house, over a man's possessions, everything we have is from God, and yet he's so good, he's allowed us to be a steward over everything he has. 1 Peter 4.10, please. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the varying grace of God. We read where the grace of giving that we would have and understand and walk in that revelation knowledge of the grace of giving. And everyone has received a gift. We've received the gift. We saw in Genesis chapter 1 where Adam and Eve were given authority, dominion and authority, to be stewards in this earth. You cannot be a steward properly unless you're given dominion and authority. So one of the gifts we received is dominion and authority to be a steward of the manifold grace of God. If we don't have authority, how can we be a steward? If you, thank you Ashlyn, if you are a steward in a house and you've not been given dominion and authority to rule in that house under the owner, and we saw that with Joseph, he was given that dominion and authority. You cannot be a steward. So it's vital that we understand our dominion and authority that Adam was given and Jesus got back for us. And one of the things Adam was given was seed. And it's the word of God, but it is also seed, the word, seed in any way. God always gives us what we need to fulfill what he's called us to do. So whatever he's called you to do, he's given you the grace and ability to do it. Right where you are today. With the wisdom and knowledge that you're walking in, realizing that the wisdom and knowledge of God is within you, and you can draw on that, and he will give you what you need to accomplish what he's called you to do. And we have seen that everyone has a call on their life. We saw in Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 1, there's a, would you pull that up please, Ashlyn? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That means that you don't go by feelings, 
but by what God is asking you to do. Next verse. So you present your bodies and be not conformed to this world. If your body is telling you what to do, if your feelings and emotions are telling you what to do, you're going to be conformed to this world. So to prevent being conformed to this world, you have to renew your mind. And we can put in your imagination, what are you seeing? that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is a foolproof formula for success. We all want, I can remember, David and I, when we first came into this, what's God's will for me? What does he want me to do? We want to do God's will. Well, as you go on through, let's look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That measure of faith we got at the birth, our new birth, our rebirth, born again birth. But that measure of faith is also for, and if you read the following verses, it gives you all the ministry gifts. Every one of us fit into one of those ministry gifts. That's the will of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And then he lists nice, I think it's seven or nine ministry gifts. God's perfect will is for you to walk in one of those ministry gifts in the body of Christ, the church. That's his perfect will. We ended up doing that without realizing that was God's will for us, but that's what you do. And we went over all those gifts, so we're not going to go over them again. You read them. But you want to know what God's will is? Present your body a living sacrifice. Be renewed in your mind. Realize you have the grace to be able, the faith to be able, the grace to be able to do what God has called you to do in the body of Christ first, those ministry gifts. Are you involved in one of those ministry gifts to benefit the body of Christ today? So we had looked at that. This is review. I don't know if it was David or somebody says, all those notes are you ever going to get through? I said, well, a lot of them are just review. We'll, we'll work on this. So then we looked at stewards of the kingdom, generational stewards. And we have to be faithful in stewarding, stewarding God's kingdom for the next generation. And you might say, well, I don't have children to steward or I really messed up with my children. Well, you're in the household of faith and we'll get into that. Why Abraham was called. But it, when you have children, if you messed up with your children, but you planted some seed in them, Laborers. Yes, yes. Laborers. Yes, yes. But you be a laborer. You be a laborer for somebody else's children. And then you're blessed when you have grandchildren because you might have missed it because you didn't know a lot of things with your children. But now the Lord has given you wisdom of the mysteries, and now you have grandchildren you can put it into. It's a great opportunity when these little ones are there and you can give them the word. I remember one time we were walking along the sidewalk and uh, it was Terrence and Aurora. I was walking along. We were doing whatever. They used to come over. We'd go to the playground. But anyway, Terrence had a problem with bees and wasps, etc. 
And by this time I had gotten and had been telling him, you have dominion and authority in the earth. So this bee was coming and he was jumping around. I said, Terrence, look. So I pointed my finger at it and commanded it to go in Jesus' name. It went. So a while later, another insect came. I don't know, a bee, a wasp, whatever. I said, Terrence, what did I tell you? You do it. You point your finger. You say it. He did. And he goes, Mama, it works. <laughs> you see, it's easy to tell your grandchildren or your children or somebody else something. But are you willing you see, you go to Psalm 103, it says that Moses and the children of Israel, Moses saw the ways of God. The children of Israel saw the acts. God has told us the way. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And others are going to see the acts. You see, you don't get all this just for yourself. When David went and he was healed at Hunter's, I was glad I was. I told you last week how he then stood up at church. I happened to not go to church that time because we had three children and they had to get to bed and all the rest of it. So I didn't go to church that Sunday night. We had service twice a Sunday. You see, he didn't keep that to himself. When God has given us revelation, it's there to share with the next generation and the household of faith and then beyond there. Which is why Dave now is so strong with, with when backs are hurting and praying for people to the point where one time somebody said, oh, I wish Pastor Dave was here, my back, he could pray for me. And I said, well, he's not going to be back until such and such a time. Oh, what am I going to do? I says, I could pray for you. They go, you can? <laughs> That's like, uh, yeah, I can. <laughs> so anyway, I did, and it, everything was fine. But still to this day, one of the children or grandchildren can come over, and they'll ask Papa to pray. They'll ask Dad to pray. I can stand and be right there. Where's Dad? And I'll say, well, he's upstairs. He'll be coming down. Oh, good, I need him to pray for me. They saw, he knew the way, and they saw the acts. Body of Christ, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing as a witness. As a witness. Hallelujah. So we saw where Joshua said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And let's go to Judges chapter 2, 10 to 12. So Joshua's generation, and we saw what happened. And also all that generation were gathered unto, no, is that what I want? Yeah, unto their fathers. And the next generation arose. See, there's Dave and I. We're faithful to teach our children, that generation. But if our children don't teach their children, there arise another generation after them which knew not the Lord. Our children are responsible for their children. But praise God, when you're in a family, you can also minister to your grandchildren. But there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done. We are to rehearse the works that God has done in our life. They didn't. They didn't rehearse how they were led out of Egypt. In the signs and the wonders and the feeding of manna. That wasn't told them. And as I was studying this, I thought, you know, I've really kind of fallen short in that area of reminding my children of the wonderful works that God has done in our life. Well, they are very familiar, but I haven't been doing it even all so much with my grandchildren. But all three of our children's eyes were healed. 
other sickness. Timon had this thing where if he got a cold, his ear would get infected and it would go to his throat because whatever tube is from the ear to the throat was short, something was wrong. Anyway, we even had the doctor come to the house. He was on some kind of antibiotic or something so often. It almost like with the three kids, we had a bottle of it on the counter all the time. He was healed. He, and I don't know, as long as he was in our house, we never had to get him antibiotics again. You see, I haven't remembered to rehearse these things. I sort of thought, well, they know. Well, you see, they have to be taught. Your children have to be taught your journey. They have to have something set up. When the children of Israel went through the Jordan, Joshua told one person from every tribe to pick up a rock and put it on their shoulder so it was a big rock. And when they got to the other side, to pile them up in a heap for a memorial, not to worship, but when they walked by and their children saw it, they could go, Daddy, Grandpa, what, are, what does that mean? And they could then tell what happened, how God delivered them out of slavery, how God delivered them, walked through the wilderness. We must rehearse to our children what God has done. How he's brought each one of us out of the land of Egypt. How he came and he revealed himself to us some minister, something that we were all born in sin and we needed a savior, our children need to know. Ashland brought out last week about unity. And it's the fear, the honor of God and his word that'll bring unity. That's what'll bring unity in a family. We have to set down and in the church. We cannot be divided. We have to believe the same thing. Next verse. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Evil is loving something God hates. God hates. One of the things God hates is pride. But evil is embracing. And you might say, well, I don't embrace evil, but it's just a little bit. It won't affect me because it's just a little bit. I'm going to tell you I heard this, t whether it's true or not, I heard this testimony. This pastor's son wanted to go to this movie, and I'm not sure, I think it was R-rated. Anyway, and so there was a little bit of uh, pornography or whatever and some cursing in it. And the father said, the pastor, who the father said, no. You can't have, watch and see that. And so the son said to him, but dad, the elders of your church, their kids can go. How many have ever had, who have children have heard, but they're allowed to do it. And so the father instead, he said, you can have all your friends over. So he invited all the friends over. And so they were playing out in the backyard, so the father decided to make them brownies. And so he made the brownies, and he went outside and got a little, they had a dog, and he got a little bit of dog poop. And he mixed it in the brownies. And so he served them, and the boys were ready to eat, and he said, oh, just a minute. Before you eat, I should tell you, there's just a little bit of dog poop in it. <laughs> But it shouldn't hurt you, it's just a little bit. And a little bit doesn't hurt. They didn't want to eat them, but they did get the message. A little bit does hurt. 
It starts with a little bit, and if your children see you entertaining a little bit, the next generation will be worse. If we can make an excuse for a little bit, the next generation will make an excuse for a little bit more, and the next generation will not have any fear of God. And you have to, as parents, make, and as a church, and as the church board, we have to make a decision to be in unity in what we're going to allow. And the church made up bylaws to protect it according to biblical standards. But we need this in our homes as well. Next verse. And they forsook the Lord. I like it that they have that in capitals because when Moses said, who can I say sent me? It said Lord. Capital. Lord. God of your fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. Of the people that were round about them. You start doing what everybody else can do. I've seen it and I've heard it where people get pulled out of the world and then they figure they should go back before they're ready and go in that same mess because now they're going to testify and be a witness. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And if God's called you into one of those situations, you should never go by yourself. You need family surrounding you when you go in there. You need other believers to go in there with you. And they bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. We have to remind and teach this generation that the word of God is number one, and it is truth, and it is the only truth. Amen. Let's go to Ezekiel 16, because we hear a lot about homosexuality, and we hear that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What was their iniquity? Pride. 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 You see, when you say there is no God, God's word isn't true. Oh, well, just a little bit of poop in the brownies won't hurt. That's pride. When you make a decision that you have an idea better than the word of God, it's pride. God's given reasons here, the reasons why he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. The fullness of bread. Prosperity. Abundance of idleness. They were so prosperous, they quit working. They were idle. They weren't doing anything. They had too much time on their hands. And teaching the next generation, they have to know to work. They're not to be idle. They're to work. They're to be taught to work. Prideful pride. Pride, well, we'll finish reading, was in her, in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. She did not give. Sodom did not give. They were not a giving people. Too much leisure time. The world today, out there, now I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were trying to shorten the work. It started with a shorter work day. Then it was a shorter work week. And now it's even shorter, shorter. And now we're paying and going to build 
homes for the homeless instead of teaching them how to work. There's a lot of work. If you're going to give somebody a home, they better work. I don't care if it's shoveling sidewalks, weeding flower beds, washing windows, sweeping the floor. It doesn't, you work. We lost a number of Christian schools to the government because of money. Because we live in a socialistic country. So we figure the government, let's bow the knee to Balaam. Let's bow the knee and get the government to give us money so we can keep the fees, the funds, the, the whatever they're called, entrance fees, lower. And I'm sure most of the parents, they could have given something up to get there. Or even if necessary, worked a second job if it's that important. But because they bowed the knee to the love of money so the government would pay, they now lost the right to have total control in that school. This isn't political, people. This isn't political. This is Bible. This is Bible. I'm telling you what the Word of God tells us. And we have to teach our children that they don't bow the knee to money. That you go to the government and bow the knee and you make contracts and you make these things for money. We have to teach them that God promises the blessing on us and he prospers the work of our hands. Sodom destroyed. Next verse. And they were haughty, again pride, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Where do you see homosexuality in here? What led to homosexuality? Pride, laziness, it leads to evil. We see today and we attack homosexuality and it's wrong, it's evil, it's contrary to the word of God, totally. But now in schools, you see it's so evil there is, as Ashlyn had brought forth, it's the fear of God, the reverence of God, his word, that will keep us going. But you take that out, and you focus on the wrong thing, now what are they doing? They are teaching little children in school. that there's no longer just two genders. And they aren't taught because the word of God has been erased that God has formed you in your mother's womb and he knit your parts together and what you came out, that's what you are. And parents, teachers, Sunday school teachers, but parents, Never, ever, 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 did I say never, ever? Let your children think you would have rather had a girl or a boy. Because somewhere along the line, Satan can put that thought in their mind and figure my parent would be happier if I was the other sex. And the school is backing it up. It is evil to teach these little children and allow them to decide what they're going to be 
and, and encourage it and to give them books where they have two mothers or two fathers or they call two women, one a mother and one a father. It's evil. Because you're calling good, what's evil, you're calling good. It's evil. And that's what happens when you get rid of the word of God. Because now, um, Premier Danielle Smith was putting in place where parents had to be told if the children want, up to a certain age, if the children wanted to change their pronouns, etc., so they came out with, oh no, we can't do that to children. We're hurting the children if we do that. They pulled this whole smokescreen, like I said last week regarding abortion, women's rights, when it's doing nothing but harming women. They pull this smokescreen, we just want the best for the children. We're concerned about the children. It's evil. And if we don't teach children the true word of God and God's morals regarding homosexuality, sex, marriage, baptism of the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands, as it said in Judges, the next generation will be lost. It's serious. We've got to get past this selfishness where it's all about me. It isn't about me, and it's not about you. And it's not just about your children. It's about the next generation and the next generation. God is generational. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's generational. He's my God, he's my children's God, and he's my grandchildren's God. Will they accept him? They will if they're taught right from an early age. Amen. The root of Sodom's homosexuality was pride. And that's what led to the abomination of homosexuality. You have to get to the root. And the root of all sin is pride. Self-centeredness, selfishness, it's pride. And what we're doing, not us, but what's happening is they have said, and unfortunately, there are churches that are embracing evil because they have been so taken up by what the world says, saying, if you say that, you're not accepting them, you're not loving them, and we have to be loving. Love is telling people the truth so they don't go to a devil's hell. Amen. If we understood what hell was, we'd do more about it to reach other people. And if we were thankful we're not going there, we would want to make sure others didn't either. Amen. Teaching the next generation. Darkness prevails where there is no light. And God's word is the light. You take out the word of God, you've got light. I used to wonder, you know, you'd read about this God Molech and how they would heat it and put their sacrifice their children. God told them way back then, don't sacrifice your children. Don't allow them to go through the fire. And in my thinking, who would do that for their child? When you've been lied to long enough, when you see the people around you and you infiltrate with them, we're doing that today through abortion. And you might say, where's the fire? 
Well, for those that were aborted through a saline solution, the children would be burned. Is that correct? And that happens when we no longer preach the word, but a social gospel. And our children have to know. I've heard spirit-filled young people say abortion isn't bad because of women's rights. They weren't taught. Or they were out in the world listening to the world so long that they didn't realize they were being brainwashed. We are not losing our next generation. They will be taught. The uncompromising word of God, they will not be allowed to be idle. They will question perhaps, but they will always have known from, from Little. I was going to say youth, but it should be before them. God's word is true, and they will be taught his morals. And when they come, what about this? There will be an answer. They may question, they may wonder. But let me tell you, it's vitally important. And parents, it's really on you. You can get... I've got an address and a phone number where parents got together... A website, parents got together and believed for a school. And then they believed for a building. It was not connected to the church, but they were all Christians. Another example of that is Living, living Waters. Living Waters. That is not a church school. It's a group of parents who got together and started a school. Parents start schools. Not money. Amen. Amen. Okay. Not money. Yeah. Amen. Maybe you can do without a pair of shoes. I don't know. But there is money. There's lots of money out there and God will get it to you if you want it for the right reason. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Pride, thinking we're smarter than God. And if you walked up to a lot of people and said, do you think you're smarter than God? They'd say no, but you'd say, why are you compromising here? If you do not take the word of God literally as your guideline, you are compromising. I'm speaking to myself as well. And that can cause strife when one want, in a household, when one wants to take it literally, this is what God said, this is what we're going to do, and the other goes, well, I don't see this is that bad. Well, just a little bit of dog poop in the brownies. <laughs> it's a lot easier than going through the whole other part of it. We are to steward our generation. We are to steward this generation. Matthew 24, 45. Who then is a faithful? We're back to faithful. And wise to servant. And he's talking about stewards. Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. I have to ask myself, am I a faithful and wise servant? Meat. The word of God is meat. He will make us rulers over his household. It's so important to teach the authority of the scriptures. That meat, that authority. 
because God's word has been dumbed down, kicked out, out of churches as well, out of homes, too busy for it. Too busy to come Wednesday night, but were you too busy to do whatever another night? We somehow have find time to do those things that feed the flesh. I can remember the church we, I grew up in and then Dave came into. They had services, too, on Sunday. Dave was more faithful than I was, going to both services. I said, well, I'll stay home with the children. Three young children, they shouldn't go at night. And so David said, okay, well, we'll take turns. I'll go, no, that's okay. I know how to put them to bed better than you do. So, I mean, I'm not just saying all these things about having something else to do instead of coming to service. But somehow we can find time to do the other things. And you might say, why do I have to come Wednesday night service or ladies Bible study? Two reasons. Same reasons you come to church. You come to church to get fed, but then you're also there to minister. You're missing out if you're not here and ministering. You're missing out because God's called us, put those giftings in us to minister. So it's not just for us to get fed. It's for us to fellowship, be around like-minded believers, and to minister to others around us. To the household of faith first. Luke 12, 42, please. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? This is the second time he's saying it. Well, it could be the same time, but a different book. Whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. A steward of his word. A steward of his word to give to the household of faith. Your own household first, and then the household of faith. You're promoted on what you do. You don't come in and say, well, I'm, I have been going to church for 55 years. And in this other church, I was all these things. So I'm going to come in here, and I expect you to honor that and give me all these things. Well, what church did you come out of? Maybe they don't believe anything we do believe. Or somebody just gets born again, and we try and put them up on a platform. You have to be a wise, faithful steward. And that starts with taking out the trash, perhaps. I had the trash in my hand from the shower. I walked in here, and immediately somebody said, Give me that. That's a faithful steward. And my first thought was to say, really? I can do this. But then if somebody wants to serve, I'm realizing to let them serve. But who is faithful? Who is faithful? Who is that faithful you see, all the wealth, talents, and abilities we possess, as well as the revelation of God's love that we have, are not our own to do with as we please. We're stewards. We're stewards of that. We've received these things from God and are therefore accountable to him for the use or misuse of these gifts. Keeping this in mind is essential fulfilling our obligation to God as stewards of his manifold grace. We're back to the first scripture we started, 1 Peter 4.10. Everything we have is from God. You see, a steward in a house doesn't have to purchase anything. He's given everything for his use and the use for other people, as God has done for us. 
Hallelujah. A steward. A household distributor. And we read of the things of God, the manifold grace of God, the gifts of God. A manager, an overseer, a preacher of the gospel. And you might all say, oh, I'm not called to be a preacher. Maybe not fivefold, but we're, a preacher proclaims, and we can all proclaim the love of Jesus and what he's done in our life. What is the requirement of a steward? It is that's to be found faithful. It doesn't matter what I did back there. Look at Paul. He was found faithful. And he was a murderer. But to be found faithful in the things of God. To be found faithful to share your faith. To be found faithful to declare his love to people and what he's done for them. We will never flourish if we're selfish or self-centered where it's all about me. I don't have the time. I don't think I like that. They probably don't appreciate me. Well, you wouldn't believe this, but Sister Io looked at me the wrong way the other day. You think I'm going to do any? You expect me to work beside her? This happens in churches. This isn't an exaggeration. It happens. Heard this morning, Keith Moore said people go about and they get offended so they don't go to church because they're offend somebody offended, a human being offended them. So what happens because a human being, a person, offended them, they get offended at God and don't come to church. As he said, you're dumber than you look. Keith Moore said that, so I figured it's okay for me to say that. <laughs> he's been in the ministry, he said, 40 years, I think, so he's got, got it way up on me, so I can say that as well. <laughs> that is dumb. That is dumb to the nth degree. I don't know, Alexander figured it out some 0000%, 000 where God's word is, the odd word might not be right. It's infallible, never changes. It is not about you, and it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Amen. And when our focus is so on Jesus and what he's done for us, there is a desire, and we renew our mind to that, and that God's word is true, and it never, we start meditating that and seeing it. You've got to see yourself serving. You have to see yourself coming to serve every service you possibly can. You've got to see yourself ministering to people. You have to see yourself laying hands on the sick. Meditate on those scriptures. You have to see it. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than ye shall ye do. Meditate on it. See yourself raising up a generation of mighty, mighty people of God that perform and know the ways of God, first of all, and then they perform the acts of God. That they will be this witness. They will know God, what God says morally. They will know why these why pride, the beginning of evil, begin, God hates pride. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of pride. And pride led to homosexuality, etc. But notice, evil preys on the godly. When those angels are, came and the men of Sodom and Gomorrah found out that they were there, they didn't care that they were godly men. They didn't ask, do you mind to come out with me? <laughs> uh, it'd be nice. I'd like it. Uh, you know, I'll show you a good time. Will you come out with me? They demanded. They demand. Evil always demands. And people are demanding to brainwash our children. 
and they're saying it's good. They're accusing God of destruction, of judgment, when Jesus put all the, had, took all the judgment on himself. There will be after we're gone. There will be judgment. But the judgment for those people is because they reject Jesus. Jesus has said that it's the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be less than some of these other cities, Chorazin and all these various cities, if they had seen the miracles. When I was reading that and I saw this and I thought, if they saw the works of God, maybe they would have repented. You see, they didn't repent. Now you go into the book of Revelation and Jesus was chastising this church because they allowed this woman Jezebel to stand in the pulpit and preach. This is what gets me. God said, I've given her time to repent. And I was talking to Ashlyn and I said, you know, it's amazing to me that God would say that. Because if that would me, I'd probably slap her, drag her out, maybe stone her. You know, like, get rid of her. She's messing up this whole congregation. God gave her time to repent. Sodom and Gomorrah had time to repent. We have time to repent. One thing will stop us from repentance. Pride. Refusing to admit we're wrong. And nothing... If you're wrong with your children, I remember this one time, oh, Brent was just disciplined. And he said, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, Jody did it. Well, Jody said it was Brent. And we showed favoritism, took Jody's side. Brent was disciplined. Well, when the truth came out, you know, I, my rug was wall to wall, so I couldn't lift it up and sweep it under. I went before him, got down on my knees so I was eye to eye with him, and asked him to forgive me and repent. And he acted like our Heavenly Father. He put his arms around me and says, Oh, Mommy, it's okay. I know you do the best you can. He says, you didn't mean that. I'm going like, you know, maybe I, de you, I deserved you to at least spit in my eye or something. That's where our Heavenly Father is. But we have to remember, we're not 100% perfect. And when we miss it, repent. If we have to apologize to our children, do so. Do so. Do so. Repent before God when we miss it. When we didn't take his word seriously. When we kind of thought a little bit was okay. And it wasn't. He doesn't hold it against us. We just have to repent and change the way we think about it. He just loves us so much. He loves us so much. And he's given us such an awesome awesome privilege of walking in dominion and authority and raising up and training the next generation and the next generation and then making preparation for the next generation. That is such a gift that he's allowed us to do that. Please stand. <clears throat> 